Hello and welcome to the Friday edition of News 360. It's coming to you live from our news up here at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. I am Aisha Yakubu. My name is Alfred Okanse. Coming up tonight. And Napa Foods. My Life Insurance. About 52 contract workers at the Jubilee field operated by Taloil test positive for coronavirus. Thursday's torrential rains rips off more than 50 houses at Wajagbawe here in Accra. Also coming up, leadership of parliament puts measures in place, including restriction visits to prevent infection of coronavirus. And in business tonight, Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Ghana COPEC projects a 5 to 8 percent increase in fuel prices next month. On the international front, the fired officer who knelt on George Floyd uh, for several minutes as he pleaded, I can't breathe, has been taken into custody. Well, I have on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Let's get into the details now. And residents of Weija and Accra have started counting their losses after Thursday evening torrential rains ripped off more than 50 houses with one casualty. Nadmo has commenced assessment of the damaged course. Thursday evening's rains, which lasted an hour and preceded by storm, wrecked havoc in parts of the municipality. Roofs of more than 150 buildings, including the area Roman Catholic Church, were ripped off, rendering dozens of residents homeless. Affected persons have begun counting their losses early Friday morning, refixing the defect. <laughs> residents posit Thursday's disaster was a third this year with greater magnitude of destruction. Some narrated their ordeal. I was sitting in the corner here cooking one day storm started it was about some few minutes to five then the roof just got off the building the one that really got damaged that of course that's a lot is the roof power supply to the municipality and beyond was also cut following the devastation of some pylons and run soon as a light pull to cry, and when you need a book, light to phone us to your home. We are there, sir. Light to phone your power much. Oh, my brother, no, by my number of course away in number. Bill will free to my yes, sir. This boy had his left ear slashed by a wafted roofing sheet in an attempt to escape the collapse of the makeshift structure. The hard uh, air was blue, is too much. So, then I tell them to come out. So after they come out, then the one of the single remove it. Then he caught in here. So I rush him to hospital to go and do it. The family of four would have to patch with neighbors to raise funds to rebuild their lives. I'm sleep outside for now because I don't have anywhere to go now. The National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, has begun assessment of damage, but they are not certain if affected persons would be offered assistance. For now, what we have been is assessing the severity of the, the disaster that has happened here. Then we will send reports to the uh, municipal assembly, then to our head office, then we know how best we can uh, help the people around here. Wager is a flood-prone area. Hundreds of homes get inundated with water and hundreds more displays annually when the Wager Dam is spilled. Zonal NADMO manager Hope Nyonyo said affected persons have been urged to evacuate before the heavy rains set in. Some of them, because they've stayed here for a very long time, they've suffered this thing, so they think it's nothing that much. So we would plead with the people again that when you know that where you are staying is a flood-prone area, please, when the rains are here, move to a higher ground where you know the rains will not affect you and your children and your properties. 
Assemblyman for the area, wants measures improved to mitigate the impacts of the perennial flooding. For Wager community, it has been long overdue. I think our major problem here is our drainage systems. So whenever it rains, then we are in trouble. Concerted efforts would be required by the Wajak Bawe Municipal Assembly to dissuade project developers from erecting structures on water courses and acquire permits before commencing projects. And in Parliament, the leadership of the House has strongly advised members of parliamentary service staff to desist from inviting the public to the legislature as MPs and other staff are reported to have tested positive to the coronavirus. Majority Leader Osei Chairman Sabonsu says any staff who intends to invite anybody must do so with the express instructions of the clerk and leadership. He made this known during the presentation of the business statement of the House. Of the increasing number of visitors to a parliament in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, contrary to a directive by your good self, right honourable speaker, in line with the COVID-19 protocols. Further to this, the House leadership has also observed that some members of parliament, research assistants, and national service personnel are reporting for duty, contrary to the directive issued by the Right Honourable Speaker, pursuant to the COVID-19 imperatives. Right Honourable Speaker, the Business Committee passionately appeals to Honourable Members and staff of the Parliamentary Service, as well as staff of other institutions working within the presence of Parliament to desist from inviting visitors to a Parliament, unless it is very, very compelling so to do. In which case, honourable members or staff or others concerned may seek clearance from leadership of their respective caucuses or the clerk to parliament. Well, just to give you an update of what's happening with respect to our case count, some 313 cases have been added now, as you might really see right there on the Ghana Health Services dedicated site for COVID-19 update. That's 7,616 up from the 7,303 that we had earlier. So this is the new case count as communicated by the Ghana Health Service. And recoveries have also increased from 2,000. 412 to 2,421. There was also an increase there. Something also to uh, note, but the death cases have remained at 34. And one place of interest is the regional breakdown. That's what's happening in the regions. The Greater Accra region, 5,331. The Ashanti region, 1,160. The Western region, which is now the new national hotspot because of the daily case uh, uh, recorded there, is 3, 000, that's 395. And that's a place to watch because later on we're going to know that some 57 personnel on Talos CSV Lancelot test positive for COVID-19. That comes on the back of some two persons who tested positive on the FPSO Kwame Nkrumah as well. We'll give you an update on that as we go on. All of this in the Western region. The Central region, 376. Eastern region, 117. Western North region, 63. Voto region, 59. Northern region, 36. OT region, 26. Upper East region, 26. Upper West region, 22. North East region, 2. And also we have Savannah region recording uh, its case as well as Bono region. And Bono East region, has recorded its first case as well. So the Ahafu region, as we speak, is the only region without a case. So that's uh, the picture with the regional breakdown there. So we have 15 out of the 16 regions, except that's Ahafu region right there, without any case of COVID-19. It's a place to watch. But when you look at the continental situation that's on the continent, this is how it looks like. South Africa is still indeed uh, on the lead with the number of cases. That's the case count, 27,403. And the recoveries as well, some 14,370. Then you go down to Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, Morocco. Ghana is on the sixth with respect to case count but very, very low uh, uh, death rates. But when you look at the recoveries as well, about 2,421, as I mentioned earlier, followed by Cameroon with 5,436. 
and the recoveries as well, 1,996. This is from the Africa.sen OVH website there, as fed by the Africa CDC website as well. So that gives us uh, the continental uh, picture as to what is happening on the continent with respect to the first seven uh, case that's countries with the number of cases right there. So that's how it really looks like right now uh, there on the continent. Uh, but we'll keep an eye as well and uh, be updating you as we go on so we understand exactly what we're confronted with. We'll go to the Western region as we go on in the bulletin to update you as well on what's happening uh, on the uh, Talo situation there. There's 57 personnel who have tested positive for COVID-19. But just to drift away a bit, we'll come back to it. But the former Minneapolis police officer seen in a video with his knee on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and faces charges of third degree murder and manslaughter. According to a Hennepin County uh, attorney, that's Mike Freeman, the officer Derek Chauvin was taken into custody uh, Friday, that's today, by the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, John Harrington, uh, said in a statement at a news conference earlier. We do know that protests erupted, as you've been saying, uh, on social media in cities across the U.S. over the deadly arrest of George Floyd, an unarmed black man who was pinned to the ground by the knee of a white officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Protesters rallied in Minneapolis for a third night on Thursday into Friday, with some demonstrators overtaking a police building and setting it on fire. The Minnesota, as you see right there on your screen, so the Minnesota National Guard has uh, arrived in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and surrounding areas as well. Now, this incident has sparked uh, some... Uh, protest there in that part of the United States of America and we understand uh, President Donald Trump is uh, addressing this matter uh, from the White House. Uh, we're going to get updates on that as we go on as well and uh, also give a local situation of what we're confronted or what uh, we're talking about right now. We're going to cross over to the United States and get an update on this shortly. Stay with us here. Uh, we're getting to uh, the U.S. shortly, specifically uh, Minnesota, to get you an update on how the reaction has led to some uh, shops being burnt. Police stations have also been burnt by the protesters. We'll give you an update on that uh, as we go on. But public policy analyst at Urban University in the United States, Dr. Hayford in Siam, has called for swift action by the federal government to reinstate confidence in black Americans following Monday's brutal murder of 46-year-old Minnesota man George Floyd. According to him, any further delays in punishing the perpetrators will deepen fears of racial abuse and white superiority. He spoke to Parker Shosari in the U.S. I feel like their right and their freedom is being taken away from them. There are instances where white people would demonstrate fight for their freedom to bear arms and the state or let's say the federal government always protect and respect that right but the same cannot be said when it comes to the freedom and the protection of black people and it's very very sad i would say that the route that is going on is as a result of black people trying to voice out their their frustration that their right and their freedom is not being respected. You know, when, when dialogue breaks down, when people's rights are not respected, when people try to communicate and you don't listen to them, one of the ways that the result is riot. I believe much can be done, or this problem can be re resolved, not by black people, but by white people themselves. If they should, they should rise up and fight for the protection and the freedom of black people, just as they are fighting for the protection, fighting for the freedom and the protection to bear arms, carry arms in this country, this problem will be resolved. Let's cross over to Skype now. My colleague, Park Yassari, who is in the U.S., uh, monitoring the situation for us there, joins me. Pa, it's in the afternoon there, so I'll go with that. But uh, you, you, you've been gauging the mood there and also what's happening at the White House. What have you been gleaning so far? 
Right, uh, Alfred, that's very true. I've been monitoring the development uh, since Monday when this whole incident broke out. Uh, a couple of uh, minutes ago, I was also monitoring that press conference by Donald Trump with a lot of people expecting that he probably would uh, make a comment on uh, the latest uh, news that's coming in uh, from uh, Minneapolis where we, we're hearing that uh, the police officer uh, has been charged with third degree felony and manslaughter. This is exactly what a lot of people expected would happen and that's <coughs> what uh, uh, essentially uh, triggered all these demonstrations we've seen uh, since yesterday up until today. Uh, it degenerated into violence where uh, some police stations were vandalized, properties destroyed, uh, shops were looted, uh, and we saw uh, the police uh, firing tear gas and, and, and also protesters in exchange, uh, pelting stones at some police officers. Uh, as you rightly heard, and as I spoke to a few uh, black Africans and uh, minority groups here, all they've been seeking for is justice, for justice uh, to, to, to be served. And, and, and it's good news to most of them that uh, just this afternoon, we are told that the police officer has been picked up and has been charged with the third degree felony and manslaughter. We also understand that the three other police officers are still being investigated and uh, pretty soon it's likely that they would also uh, be charged. Uh, interestingly, Donald Trump has uh, not said anything uh, about this latest information. Indeed, uh, all he said uh, mainly was about uh, sanctions uh, on China, and, and, and this, this has been a long battle between the U.S. and China, and, he, and he's been very strong on, on, on the sanctions, and, and he feels that uh, China is responsible for a lot of the things that have happened, especially in relation to the pandemic. So, uh, really, if you ask me, people are excited, uh, they, are, they are happy about this latest news. Uh, uh, as you may be aware, also, there's been a curfew uh, imposed yeah. on the Minneapolis states today, mm -hmm. uh, and state guards are there to protect uh, lives and property. And all of this is happening with COVID-19 as well there. But do you see any end in sight, at least with the interactions you're having with the protesters, do you see any end in sight to this protest, especially now that the persons have been charged? Um, like I said, Alfred, uh, all throughout since Monday after this incident came out, all people have been expecting is for justice uh, to be served. Uh, um, uh, in the state of Nashville, for instance, uh, they were expecting to hold a rally uh, tomorrow to, you know, essentially uh, speak against police brutalities and white supremacy. Uh, with this latest information, I do not know if that uh, rally is still going to come up tomorrow. Um, and so we just wait to see. But this certainly is going to calm a lot of nerves and uh, give some reassurance to the black community and minorities that indeed their rights are being protected and that they also do matter. But I want to thank you so much for this update. And stay on this for us, but stay safe as well out there. Uh, and uh, we'll connect with you some more again. Thank you. Super. That's uh, Parkus Yossari uh, joining us from the U.S. He's monitoring the situation there. And stay with us here on TV3. We'll be updating you subsequently. In some more stories this evening, spokesperson for the National Chief Imam Sheikh Harmiyao Shaibu says governments must not consider a partial lifting of restrictions on religious gatherings as that will not benefit Muslims. Speaking to TV3, he said the president should maintain the restrictions or lift it completely to benefit all religious bodies. Akufuado is expected to speak to the nation on Sunday, May 31st. Many are anticipating a possible lifting of restrictions on social and religious gathering, be it partial or total lifting. While some Christian groups believe a partial lifting of restrictions can allow them to conduct services and faces, the Muslim community says it won't work for them. According to them, their faith does not allow them to meet in faces. Speaking to TV3 after a disinfection exercise at the Muslim Central Mosque led by Zoom Lion at Obusokai, he said, the president should maintain the restrictions or lift it completely to benefit all religious bodies. The arrangement doesn't also go with our tradition. We stand on rows, shoulder to shoulder, toes to toes. So the issue, the issue of social distancing then becomes a much more problem for us. That's why we say that partial easing will not be applicable to us. So if it's either completely, complete easing or maintaining the, 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 the restrictions. He added, 
Unlike Christians, Muslims' time for worship is constant and cannot be changed. He expressed gratitude to just one group of companies for disinfecting the central mosque and called for disinfection of all other mosques and churches across the country before the restrictions are lifted. Joseph Armstrong Go with Alibi TV3. Well, some 57 contract workers at the Jubilee field operated by Talo Oil have reportedly tested positive for COVID-19, thus allegedly contributing to the spike in the number of cases in the Western region, which has become the hot spot in the country. I've been joined on telephone lines by the Western Regional Health Director, Dr. Jacob Mahama, for some more on this. Doc, thank you. Good evening to you. First off, can you update us on the situation... Um, can you update us on the situation on the vessel now? Yeah, as you already know, um, we have two cases on on the on the vessel that were actually suspected of uh, uh, having symptoms of uh, COVID-19. So they were thrown by the company to Accra in their hospital where samples were taken and tested and they came out positive. And then they did a second uh, confirmatory test because it came out positive again. So because of that, they had to go and screen the rest of the people on the vessel. And then we had 55 more uh, uh, cases turning positive. Yes, but the first two cases uh, was on the FPS Kwame Nkrumah. But with the communication on this 57 is that it was on the CSV Lancelot. Uh, are these, these are two uh, different vessels, I guess. Yeah, the main vessel that took the uh, bus of 200, that is where the first two cases came from, as I was told by the doctor. Okay, so, uh, Doc, I want you to listen to me on the phone. It appears you listening with the television, so there's some gap. But no, I'm not if, listening to your great. television. So, I, I want to find out now if contact tracing has started, um, and what, what, what form is it going to take? The, the 50, um, five cases that we had are actually contacts that have been traced because uh, they work with these people on, on in the vessel. That's a close environment. Before they go to work on that vessel, they usually go to a mandatory 14 days in the hotel in Takwari. And when nothing happens, before they go on the, onto the uh, vessel. Right. So, and then the people virtually are cut off from their families. Okay. I see. Yeah, so, so we, we, there, there's no contact tracing here. They, they are the actual the contacts that have been traced, the 55. Right. Um, but how about the, the 55, their families? Um, is there any way they came into contact with other persons yes. of the vessel? Yeah, that's what I mean. When they left home, before they got onto the vessel, they had a 14 day mandatory quarantine. In the quarantine, when they, uh, they, nothing is uh, found, or no uh, um, symptoms are actually shown, or temperature. Above this age, then they are then let onto the vessel. Right. So it's rather true that I'm not very sure whether they did go through the mandatory 14 days. If they did, then I'm sure they will have actually gotten the infected or carried the infection onto the vessel. That I'm not very sure about. Yeah, they have not told me the details surrounding these two people. Great. So, Dr. Mama, the, the situation is under control there with, with, with this particular case? Yes, because right. uh, they have. Got two hotels in town here that have the capacity of 42. Right. Where they keep them here in the uh, in, in, in the hotel. I mean, this uh, 55. And you have another facility in Accra which has the capacity of 50. So the rest have been thrown to Accra okay. to uh, be isolated in those in, in that facility. That's clear. I want to thank you very much for this update, and we'll be following You're up some more. Great. Okay. Dr. Jacob Obama is the Western Regional Director of Health Services. There, but Talo Ghana says all affected personnel on board CSV Lancelot and the NKN vessels, that's uh, the Kwame Kuma, that's FPSO, who tested positive are being brought on shore for isolation and case management. That's what they have decided to do. Now, this follows confirmation that 57 of the 200 personnel on board the two vessels are being tested for COVID-19. Also, Talo is saying that its immediate concern is for the safety and well-being of personnel and the public and to minimize any potential 
for the spread of the virus. The company is collaborating with the Ghana Health Service as started with enhanced social distancing on both vessels and permanent restrictions of movement between CSV Lancelot and FPS Okwame Kuma is also in place as we speak. The affected individuals are in good health and have been medically evacuated from the two vessels to an onshore isolation facility for monitoring. Talo assured the public production on board FPSO remains unaffected. That's to note there. The company says it is committed to the WHO and Ghana Health Service safety protocols and procedures to limit the risk of the spread of COVID-19. Let's go to the presidency now, where President Kufuado says eight districts in the Upper East region have been identified to benefit from the Agenda 88 hospital project, which begins in July. The presidents made the revelation when the chiefs and elders of the Bonaboto traditional area in the Talency district of the Upper East region called on him at the Jubilee House. The visit by the chiefs and elders of the Bonaboto traditional area in the Upper East region was to discuss pertinent issues confronting the area. Paramount chief of the area and member of the Council of State, Tong Rana Kulbisong Naleptang Robert Mosori, warned President Ekofado to give consideration to maintaining Bogotanga as a location for the Upper East Regional Airport instead of Paga. Bolgatanga is central in the Upper East region and Northeast regions, and to major towns including Walewale, Boku, Zebla, Nalergo, Navrango, etc. And that's convenient for all travelers. President Ekofado assured them all effort to be made to consider that request. The president, however, added that some areas in the region will benefit from government Agenda 88 Health Project. Able to identify eight districts in the Upper East, which have not got hospitals and who are part of Agenda 88. That is Binduri District, <coughs> Bosa South, Casina Nankana West, Nabdam District, Pusiga, Bogatanga East, Timpani, and Garu. Those are the eight hospital districts that have been identified for the, as part of Agenda 88. We intend uh, on Agenda 88, God willing, everything being okay, to start in July. We're hoping that by the end of June, all the various arrangements that have to be gone through will be complete so that by July uh, we can begin it. I want to make sure that within a year, all of those projects are complete. President Kufuado further assured them that all the other concerns they have about Bogatanga Town Road, the elevation of the Bogotanga Regional Hospital and the approval for the Gurini language to be included at the Basic Education Certificate examination will be given immediate attention by his administration. Stay with us here on News 360. Business News is up next with Manisha Sabra. You're still watching News 360. A very good evening to you. Thanks for staying with us. Time for business. My name is Nanekria Mensah Brampa. We're entering the weekend with what I term as not too much good news because the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Ghana, COPEC, has projected a 5 to 8% increase in fuel prices at the local pumps during the first pricing window in June. Now, this, the Executive Secretary, Duncan Amwa, attributed to the nearly 2% depreciation of the city this month and rebouncing of crude oil and petroleum prices on the international market. Unlike previously when it was on a decline, now it shot up from the 95 to almost 400 uh, per metric as far as uh, price of gasoline and gas oil is concerned. What that means is that it's likely Ghanaians would have to pay more. Uh, for this window which ends on Sunday evening, uh, fuel prices would equally have gone up but for girls insistence that they wouldn't go up a lot of the omcs have also had to stay prices the understanding we get is that effective monday uh, almost every single omc would have gone up on their prices between five to eight percent uh, we would want to ask the public 
to take advantage of uh, the period between now and Monday to fuel up because it's likely you'll be paying more for fuel by Monday. These increases indeed are not a function of government. Taxes have not gone up. Uh, the CD seem to be losing quite some ground over the period also, but largely due to international market um, differences. Now it's gone up by quite a huge jump. And so in as much as we would have wished to pay lower for fuel, uh, these are understandable dynamics. The only caution we would throw also to the OMCs is that don't increase it so huge. Just stagger it piecemeal for all of us like you did when prices were coming down. If you could do uh, something even lower than the 5% minimum prediction, uh, as we've been told, I'm sure that Ghanaians will be a bit easier in adapting to these uh, increases or changes on the international market. But this has got nothing really to do with government. Well, Kopeg there with that prediction. On Monday, we would visit the various local pumps to tell you exactly what the prices are in terms of uh, the fuel. And uh, let's move away from that. The African Union Summit, which is scheduled to be held in South Africa on May 30, to encourage trade negotiators to complete their bargaining on tariff reductions, rules of origin, and other necessary regulations has been postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We ask... Will the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement take off on July 1, 2020? The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFCFTA, aimed at removing trade barriers and in turn boosting intra-Africa trade, was brokered by African Union and signed on by 44 of its 55 member states in Kigali, Rwanda on March 21, 2018. The AU summit, which was scheduled to hold in South Africa on May 30 to encourage trade negotiators to complete their bargaining on tariff reductions, rules of origin and other necessary regulations has been postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It remains unclear if the July 1 date for takeoff of the trade agreement still stands. Whether July 1st is postponed or not, the agreement is in force already. However, certain protocols would have uh, had the full ship around 1st July. As we are speaking, we have uh, about close to 30 member states, those who have completed phase one, phase two, phase three of um, how to qualify as a member state. And we need all 54 countries to member states. Already, some policy think tanks are calling for this date to be deferred following the pandemic. Louis Afo, Ghana rep for the AFCFTA, says a virtual summit will be held to declare the status of takeoff. If July 1st comes and most countries have not yet completed their stages of uh, ratification and submission of uh, letters of ratification, they cannot enjoy the tariff. And in February, they submitted their concession list, but few were able to meet that deadline. And so, well, whether trading starts July or not, uh, the agreement is already in phase, I mean, it's in force. And so, but I know that um, the Secretary General, His Excellency Wankele, has submitted uh, proposals to the heads of states to uh, postpone. Uh, and the heads of states are the only people who have the power to decide whether to postpone or to, to, to continue trading. Senior lecturer and head of public law department at the Gimpa Faculty of Law, Dr. Alex Anson, says the AFCFTA is a positive development for intra-Africa trade and wants member countries to work towards the convergence criteria. In the post-COVID era, the economic prospects that the, the CFTA offers can be a catalyst or can, uh, can urge the countries that have not yet ratified to do so. But I also think that some of the countries that have not ratified haven't done so, not because they are, uh, you know, they, they, they are pulling their feet, but they may want to uh, engage more broadly with their constituents back home. The agreement requires members to remove tariffs from 90% of goods traded following free access to commodities, goods and services across the continent. According to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the elimination of tariffs could boost trade in Africa by 15 to 25 percent in the medium term.
And Toyota Ghana Company Limited has launched the all-new Toyota Corolla model and the latest Toyota Aja during the coronavirus pandemic. The two new vehicles were unveiled at the company's showroom. The Japanese brand revealed a funky new design which has gone through multiple designs over generations and has progressed to become the world's best-selling car. The new Toyota Corolla comes in two variants, 1.8 liter and 1.6 liter engines. A new sleek design with LED lamps and a wireless charging port within the car truly spells smart with many variant colors to choose from. The newest addition to the family of Toyota vehicles, described as agile, roomy and stylish, was the second vehicle introduction of the night. The Toyota Agya has an automatic transmission and powered by a 1.0 liter engine that gives real value for money. Speaking to TV3, Head of Sales Operations Andrew Lamte said the new Toyota Agya would be ideal for individuals and those in taxi hailing services. A new version of the most for, uh, famous salon car called the Toyota Corolla. We have introduced the 2020 version of the Corolla with a lot of style and at a very competitive price. The new Toyota Corolla goes for 165,000 Ghana cities for the 1.6 litre and 195,000 cities for the 1.8 litre and 88,500 cities for the Toyota Agya. All vehicles come with free fuel and three years warranty. Being the top brand, I can't say because when you move out of our, on our roads, between five to six vehicles that you count on our road are Toyota. And therefore, Toyota plays a very major role when it comes to the automobile market in Ghana. And we have worked with the government to be able to come out with this automotive policy that we believe it is in the best interest of Ghanaians. Well, so that's the Toyota Agya. I was thinking it was actually Toyota Fire because COVID-19 and a new release, I would have to upgrade my car now from 2016 to 2020. I'm hoping the price will be quite good when we go to the showrooms. But that's about it. You can log on to 3news.com for more business news updates. My name is Nanekria Mensah Brampa. We have sports next with Juliet Bewa. Enjoy your weekend. Good evening. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Juliet Bewa. Now, a member of the newly constituted board of Kumase Asante Kotoko, Bafo Kwame Kusi, is excited about the challenge. Speaking to TV3, he expressed their team's readiness to commit to the club. <laughs> Sante <laughs> Now, away from that, as a decision is yet to be taken on January's Africa Cup of Nations, stakeholders have picked up conversation around the subject. In our special series of interviews asking what to do with the tournament, we hear from Uganda and Gambia national team coaches that the weather for a June tournament in West Africa is always going to be challenging. Um, and so to play a tournament in Cameroon in June may well be challenging, but that doesn't make it impossible. Um, you can obviously try to limit those factors as best you can. So, yeah, it's not an easy decision. You know, I hope we can play it in January, but ultimately the health and well-being of, of People, players, officials, supporters has to come first and, and we'll just have to abide by whatever decision is taken by CAF and by FIFA. 
most AFCONs, uh, the stadiums are quite empty. Only the host and, and the important games have a lot of crowd. So if you would uh, decide to play an AFCON without fans, you will have probably more television right money. You will have more sponsors because they know more people will watch uh, football on TV and even all over the world because there's a lack of football. So I think it has a lot of advantages what we can take. Uh, for me, we have to play AFCON maybe in January, maybe in uh, June, all depends of the health situation in Cameroon. Like I said before, health is a priority. So from the coaches, we have also been speaking to some African journalists on the growing concerns. Of the many contributing to the discourse are journalists who have seen the AFCON come alive too many times. South African journalist Robert Marara believes going ahead with the competition will be fatal. You don't want to endanger the lives of football players because at the end of the day a decision can be taken to try and save a tournament. But that will be detrimental because as I always say football remains a contact sport. Marara gets support from fellow countryman Thomas Konaite, who also thinks it shouldn't happen. All countries trying to get to Cameroon have only played two rounds of matches. They still left with four more rounds and with such a relatively short period of time. When and how are the countries going to squeeze in those four rounds before January 2021? Algerian journalist Maha Mezahi and SABC's Vilele Nyandu say a decision may be too early and must be thought through well. Uh, it's going to be an incredible amount of pressure to put on Cameroon, the host country as well, to not only deal with organizing this tournament but also dealing, dealing with this crisis that they're dealing with at home as well. So I think at the moment we're trending towards uh, maybe a postponement of the Cup of Nations but if you push it towards the summer month, you're going to be competing with the Olympics and the Euros and a lot of different major international tournaments. AFCON is the cash cow of CAF, you know, um, in terms of the amount of money which they derive from that event, um, in terms of the revenue. So maybe we should be talking about postponing it uh, to some later time. The clock ticks for CAF to decide on the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. Whatever decision is taken will have significant impact on Africa's biggest football showcase. Now still staying at the headquarters of CAF and the Ghana Football Association is set to receive $200,000 from the Confederation of African Football as a relief fund. The amount is part of a block that will be transferred to the 54 member associations on the continent as part of a relief effort to ease the financial burden on the African Football Federations during these unprecedented times. So CAF boss Ahmad Ahmad says um, they intended to ease their financial burdens of their member associations. So that's your sports here on News 360 with me, Juliet Bewa. Good evening. Time for some entertainment news. I'm Anita Ikea Akufu. Now, the debate on who started Azunto has been ongoing for years with some artists claiming to have started the genre. The likes of Sarkodie, Gasmela, and EL have been tagged as the originators, but rapper Stage A thinks otherwise. The conversation on who began the popular Azonto genre is one that has existed since 2013. A few weeks ago, the hashtag Bring Back Azonto campaign, which was started by Sarkodie on Twitter, generated a controversy on which artist pioneered Azonto. William Kujo Johnson, known in showbiz as Day J, in an interview with TV3 Entertainment, waded into the conversation on who created the Azonto genre. The musician believes that Zonto doesn't belong to any artist and Ghanaians need to be educated on that. I think the Azonto vibe is very good and it has been great for Ghana music genre. We just have to educate our fans and the people out there very well. Azonto doesn't belong to any artist. It's our culture and it belongs to all of us. The rapper Feda stated that, apart from Kelvin Boy, Kim Promise, Kamido, Kwame Eugene and Kiri, the new group of artists need to be more creative in their composition. I don't like their composition of music because they have been doing people's songs and 
also singing lyrics to lyrics, which is very bad. I think you have to be more creative. But I've sidelined a couple of them, which I like very best because they are doing very good music. When it comes to um, um, Kel um, Kelvin Boy, when it comes to um, Kim Promise, Camido, Kwame Uji, Kiddy, they're doing very good. The artist who took a break off the music scene for a while says he is back to stay and is currently promoting his new song titled Jet. <laughs> And now the excitement certainly continues on the leading and most watched dating game reality show, Date Rush. The show takes a different turn this Sunday with a season three reunion where the contestants bear it all. Date Rush has become that one show lovers of quality and exciting television content cannot afford to miss for anything. It is amazing the conversation the show generates across various social media platforms which eventually ends on the streets. On the last episode, producers of the show at the Subway Production Limited hinted at an excitement galore that awaits viewers as the season reunion starts airing from this weekend at 8 p.m. The three-episode season three reunion show will bring back all the participants of the show, those who got dates as well as those who didn't get dates. Why did Michael choose me? Why did he leave Lady? Why is he vibing with Lady now? Abraham and Michael. You are telling lies. That is Mike. So if a friend did that, then it's Mike because you see it's from the first Mike. section. It's not Mike. They are it's not Mike. Participants will be able to recap their high and low moments as well as discuss their life after participating in the show. For those who got to date, it will be an opportunity to know the status of their relationships. Date Rush airs on TV3 this and every Sunday at 8 p.m. I can definitely promise you a bag of entertainment, suspense and drama on the season three reunion of Date Rush. You can't afford to miss it this Sunday at 8 p.m. right here on TV3. But that's it for entertainment. My name is Anita Ikuyakufu. Have a beautiful weekend. Certainly. I, and, and you know, it, it appears um, the president even knows uh, when Date Rush is going to air. So, you know, uh, there's going to be an, an address. All things being equal, maybe on Sunday, yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's gonna be before, or maybe that's during the date rush time. It could be either before or after. Just watch this. I shall bet. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you so much. My name is Alfred Okanse, and I did this with. <laughs> you have a good weekend. <laughs>